Okay, so hi, I'm Miss Um I'm starting the presentation with a little bit of advertisement for the uh, Oikos uh, Society meeting in Lund uh, next year. It's going to be uh, the 12th to the 15th of March. Uh, in 10 days, there's the deadline for the abstracts. And although it's usually very ecologically uh, focused, it's this time very... Um, uh, it also has some um, evolutionary because you have to be in front of it for it to. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's over here. How about it shift? And so these are some of the headers of the um, sessions that they have planned. So, for example, urban ecology could be interesting for some of the people here. Um, and they are really trying to make the evolutionary um, part of it uh, interesting as well. So uh, it's only 50 minutes from the main station to Lund by train. So it's really easy to get there. Um, so if you're interested in adding another uh, conference to your list, then this would be a really good one. So then uh, I'm quickly going through who I am. Uh, I did my master's in uh, bachelor's and master's in the Netherlands, and then uh, did some projects uh, on phylogenetics um, with lots of uh, um, bone samples from um, archaeological collections. So that's when I also learned my uh, laboratory skills. And then I did a science project uh, after my master's with Katja Nowik at Leipzig University, where I uh, really got to learn bioinformatics. Um, then I continued to do my PhD uh, at Naturalis at Leiden University on amphibian hybrid zones, and that's where I will talk most about today. Um, and uh, during that time, I visited uh, Professor Bradley Schaefer at the, U at the University of California in Los Angeles to learn red sequencing. After that, I did my first postdoc in Germany working on plants this time, which have huge genomes, um, and we did uh, genetic and epigenetic variation uh, in an invasive species. Um, and then I went on to do a postdoc in Lund, actually, that's why I know people there, um, on po pollinator insect um, genomic landscapes. So basically, I know a lot about in many systems a little bit. So if you have questions about any of these things, don't hesitate to come to me. Uh, and today I will talk about my um, uh, Marie Curie project that I'm uh, recently started here in Anton's group. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically I will try to kind of give you the theoretical framework today for my um, project. So I will start with a short history of uh, how the project got to that I'm actually starting and have the money to, to work on it. Um, then I will explain you a little bit about why amphibian genomes are weird to work with. I will talk a little bit about um, uh, the theory and the hypotheses that are in general uh, are used within hybrid zone research. And then I will slowly kind of also interweave the system. And to give you a little teaser, uh, I did field work uh, this spring. And basically, this is one of the species uh, morphology, and this is the other species of morphology, and this is the hybrid morphology. And this three toes were caught in the same little fire tracks um, in the field. So it was like my dream come true to see these three morphologies and have them all in my hands and be able to sample them. It was really like, this is what it's all about. And so keep that a little bit in mind if, during the presentation, maybe. Um, so to give you a little bit of a history of the project, um, when you look at my CV, you see that, wow, I got this Marie Curie, but it was actually a reapplication. It took a lot of work amongst others from the people here as well. Tom and Anton both read it like a thousand times and helped me like mold it into the most perfect <laughs> application. Um, but it was preceded by a lot of uh, tries. So this is the reality of that I'm actually standing here 
and with the help of a lot of other people as well. So uh, when you talk about uh, genomes, and I say ridiculous genomes, is uh, that if you compare amphibian species to other species, they have really, really big genomes. So they range uh, in size from one gigabase base pairs to 120 gigabase pairs. Um, and if you try to visualize that, this scale is a uh, lot and it's in megabase pairs. Um, and uh, you see here amphibians. Uh, if you compare to other like uh, mammals, humans have 3.7, right? Genome. This is a much, much bigger range. So it gives you a lot of problem. It's about as problematic as some plant species. So it's really a different type of thinking about what type of data do you need. Um, and how to look, how to work with these genomes if you want to know something about the what's going on evolutionarily. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of M50, it's when you assemble a genome, you get pieces, and if you order them from large to small, if you go halfway, that's how big the M50 is. So for the human genome, we know whole chromosomes, we know exactly where everything is. Um, but if you, I made this overview for my thesis in 2019, and uh, the top two species are laboratory species, so those are very well studied, and you already see that um, the 1.4 gigabase pairs genome was fine to assemble. It's com in comparison to the human genome, uh, it has apparently much longer uh, chromosomes. But um, if you look at the ambisoma which has a much, much larger genome, the N50 is much, much smaller, which basically means you don't kind of know what a whole chromosome should look like. You just know little bits and pieces. And then after that, it's downwards really fast. Um, recently, a lot of genomes have come out for amphibians, and this has improved a lot, but it still kind of shows that these are really difficult genomes to work with. <laughs> Um, did I? I think it's kind of yeah. like working slowly. Yeah, I have to push it in. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, uh, having said all those things about genomes, what I'm interested in mostly is speciation. And, um, kind of classically, we think of two lineages uh, separating, and then after a while, you have no more, um, exchange of genes between those lineages. That's kind of the classical way to think of speciation. Um, there are some uh, interesting other things possible, so, such as speciation reversal or, or hybrid <laughs> speciation. And uh, the laboratory species um, Xenophus that we just saw in the overview actually is an example of a hybrid speciation. We know uh, that the laboratory species is that kind of the result of two lineages coming together. And we know the other species, we just don't know uh, which the third remaining species is, where it came from. Um, but then uh, there is this phenomenon of a stable hybrid zone. And the way you kind of uh, need to think about them is that you have these two geographical distributions, which are really, really large. Um, and then you have this really tiny geographical area where the two species overlap and interbreed. Um, so that's the type of thing that um, we're going to look at mostly with my project. And uh, the way that classically this is done is with a morphology or with a couple of SNPs. And you try to look at uh, how those SNPs behave in the landscape. So basically, if you have this type of example, and you have a sampling plan where you go from one species to the other in the landscape, what you can do is you can make a graph with distance and frequency <clears throat> and follow where these, like how these distributions occur across the landscape and draw a line through that. 
And this is very simplistic, of course, but you need, you need many, many, many samples. And then you can draw clients like this. And this is a very old concept, but it's quite interesting because you can really look at different aspects. So classically, these type of clients were thought to get stuck in a transition in environments. So for example, you have um, um, low altitude species and a high altitude species, and you would expect the hybrid zone to sit on a slope of a mountain, basically. Um, and the more steep the mountain, the more steep you would expect the frequency. But another thing could be a dispersal barrier. The more uh, dispersal is stopped by this barrier, the steeper the climb is, the easier it is to get across, the less steep it is. But there's other things influencing the shape of this climb. So for example, uh, selection against hybrids. Hybrids are usually less fit because of the uh, Dobzowski-Müller incompatibilities and sometimes just because of ecology. If you have two species that are adapted to different environments, the intermediates of them are not going to be adapted to anything. Um, so that, like, the stronger that selection is, uh, the steeper decline you will get. And uh, dispersal rate is another thing that's really of big influence. Last year, I visited a lab in Denver where they studied um, birds, and the clients that they had were all much more uh, shallow because of birds flying and amphibians. I'm used to looking at these really steep clients because amphibians have really, really slow dispersal. So that was really an eye opener for me to see like, okay, yeah, it's really a big deal for these animals and for how you see the hybrid zone. So just to give you a couple of examples from my previous work, um, during my PhD, I did a project with uh, bioinformatics students and uh, uh, Fernando Sicar, who was like the local guy who knew this hybrid zone. And he was interested in getting um, some more information on this hybrid zone. So with the bioinformatics students, we made a pipeline and uh, designed primers for SNPs. And uh, the system was between two uh, subspecies. So you expect quite low um, um, selection against hybrids uh, in the genetic sense. Um, and there's there are this really cool uh, amphibian with a very, very long slender tail. They breed in um, um, rivers and streams mostly. Um, so uh, when uh, we got the samples, so basically the white uh, dots and the dots with an S are one subspecies and the black dots are the other species. And you can see a river runs through it. So my thought was the river has to be a, a distribution uh, or a dispersal um, barrier. So I made the climbs that I was supposed to make. And I thought all the time, like, I made a mistake because this can't be true. For example, most of the clients that were situated together, which we would call the hybrid zone center, they were displaced away from the river, which is represented by the blue uh, dotted line, um, as well as that there were these clients all over the landscape, which is kind of what you would expect as well with a uh, low um, um, selection against hybrids, but not really. So in the end, I was like, okay, I, I checked everything that I did. I did it right, I think. So I checked with Fernando and he was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because these populations, he tried to find uh, animals there and he had a really, really hard time to find any populations in that area. So around the river, there is this lowland area where the species somehow just doesn't really thrive. And then what you get is like high drift. So these clients will ping pong across the landscape. And, um, and that really caused this pattern. And that was really like, ah, oh, yeah, that's why mm -hmm. you need to check back with the people in the field, right? Because they sometimes have very good explanations for what you're seeing. So my uh, last project for my PhD was on the common toads, which have this uh, really cool hybrid zone straight across front, so it's really long. It's very nimble. Um, and there's uh, two species, they, uh, you cannot really tell them apart. The only pe person in the world who can tell them apart is my supervisor for my PhD. <laughs> um, and he says like even uh, what he uses morphologically doesn't work everywhere. So it's really hard to take them, uh, tell them apart. 
but they have they have like two million years old divergence between them so they are quite genetically different so what we did is we took two transects across uh, far apart from each other across the hybrid zone do you want to try with your own it's in my office and i'm nearly i'm nearly yeah it's yeah maybe it's better but it's kind of living its own life <laughs> yeah I I feel like afterwards i want to try with yours and see if ours is broken yeah yeah but that, anyways yeah. um so i got uh thousands of snips with red sequencing for these two species and uh for those of you not familiar with uh, a mixture plots basically um each pond that we sampled is like one block separated by the white lines. And then um, in the middle, you can see that each block consists of multiple small uh, bar graphs. And basically, this algorithm decides uh, how much of an individual comes from one population and how much from the other population. So this is one species in blue and one species in red. And then you can see we kind of have every sort of uh, stage of the hybrid zone um, represented in our plot. And of course, I drew also thousands of those clients then, because that's what we were excited about. And uh, I'm just showing you one, one type of analysis that you can do and one type of information you can get from that. So because if you have so many of those clients um, drawn across your landscape, you can actually use um, statistics to say, OK, actually, these clients are much, much more steep than the clients in general. So that allowed us to look at uh, clients that were so steep and uh, telling us that basically these variants, which are represented by the green, um, occur very little together. So basically, you have either one or the other in a population. You never have them coexisting, the two variants from the two species. Um, and that, of course, would kind of hint towards a dobsonsky miller incompatibility or something like that. Um, so that we could really see these patterns. We could see that in the two transects, there are different numbers, quite different. So one is uh, 56 and the other is 121 um, markers that behave like that, SNPs that behave like that. But when we overlap, we found 36 that were behaving like this in both hybrid zones. And that's a really strong signal that it might be something uh, that genetically keeps these two species apart everywhere where the hybrid zone is. So after my PhD finished, the genome came, became available. And I was super curious where on the genome are these 36 markers. And some of them, as you can see, they occur together. For example, this little lump uh, on the third chromosome. So we tried to see which genes are there or what is going on there. Um, but unfortunately, uh, like what I could find was that it was associated with limb length in pigs. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I don't know about that. It probably does something developmental in these frogs as well, but we really need more information. Um, but at the time, 2019, this was what we like very close that we could get to getting those types of answers. So I was kind of happy to see that actually what we did statistically with the very like low level method that, method that we use it still gives you uh, results like this. So another uh, hypothesis that I'll be looking at uh, in my uh, project is one that comes from a hybrid zone in mice, domestic mice, um, from the hybrid zone in southern Germany and Denmark, we know that um, some mice that are hybrids have much higher parasitic load. And the idea is that since those populations are less healthy, they are much more prone to get parasites. Mm -hmm. um, but when that was checked uh, in this publication from 2012, they took 700 mouse, mice from different areas. They actually find the opposite. Mm -hmm. So here you see the old study over here. You see this kind of a, a positive uh, interaction between uh, when you have a higher uh, a hybrid index. So I need to explain that. If you are a hybrid index zero, you're one species, 
one is the other species, and 0.5 you would be like the first generation offspring. Um, and all these axes, uh, all these y axes have some sort of representation of parasitic load. So the higher uh, up the scale you are, the higher the load is. So for that old studies, those old studies, they found positive relationship there, but the new study found a negative relationship there. And the authors already noted that it was actually in this hybrid zone very hard to find these uh, hybrids that were sitting in the middle. Um, so that might be uh, a weird thing that happens with mice specifically. But uh, they also explained this result that maybe actually because the populations where you have hybrids, you have two different variants of, of genes going around, you have um, potentially uh, for all these different uh, parasites, you have kind of adaptive genes around that you can use in the populations to not get sick. So those are the two kind of opposing hypotheses there. So um, for frogs, one of the really big problems uh, worldwide is that they have this chytrid fungus that came from Asia uh, at some point and spread worldwide, uh, probably with the fat trade, which really like kills whole populations. It's really devastating um, to see it because I, I've seen it as well in the field. It's really sad. I can tell you about it, but <laughs> um, maybe not today. Um, uh, so in this system uh, where I'll be working on, this is the classical system, the Klein analysis that I just showed you, that all is based on basically this hybrid zone, except that their genome is uh, 10 gigabase pairs. So uh, it's not really studied with modern techniques yet, um, but hopefully we'll be able to do that. And you can see that uh, this is the area where we're gonna do the project. And those two red circles show uh, where we're aiming to sample. So basically you have two variants of the uh, lowland species, the yellow or orange species, and you have the, the red species that is like the Eurasian um, uh, distribution. Um, so here I kind of made an overview of the um, study that I'm gonna do. So uh, those two areas are supposed to have a different way of transitioning between the two species. So one is much more patchy and one is very steep. Um, and in those two areas, we'll look at several things. So first of all, like, is there gene flow between the two species? Um, is there any association between genes uh, between like highly infected animals or very little infected animals? We already know from the literature that the lowland species is much more affected by chytrid fungus than the highland species. Um, but what we don't know is whether there is anything in the, going on in the hybrid sets like lower or higher uh, infection with, with this uh, fungus. We'll also look at the microbiome because we know from other studies that this can be super, super um, species specific in amphibians, um, but we don't know. And it's usually very associated also with um, being able to cope with, with chytrid fungus, uh, but we don't know anything about that. So that will be kind of like the preliminary data set that will generate hopefully for the next uh, funding. Um, so that's kind of the rough plan of uh, the project. Um, and uh, of course, I was not able to work on this on my own. So there's a lot of people involved uh, already um, who have been super helpful with uh, finding toads in the field and getting kids into the field and setting up the sampling and everything. So uh, thanks, everybody.